wonderful positive upbeat verse to, to examine today. So, you know, nothing like starting off on a high note. <laughs> So I do best. I, I don't do anything better than make people uncomfortable when I preach, so I, I hope I can manage to do that today. So thank you, Dan, for that kind introduction. Uh, as Dan mentioned, my name is Garrett. This is my beautiful wife, Jessica. Uh, make sure to mob her before she leaves, and make sure to rub her belly. She really loves that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the Lord has blessed us here recently. He's discovered we'll be welcoming our first child into the world this August. So a beautiful, healthy son. <laughs> oh, yes. So it's been quite an, we found out in November, so it's been quite an exciting five months now. And we still have about a, approximately 101,000 things to do between now and then. It's a combination of excited and a little panicky, but we're grateful and we're so blessed and we're excited to become parents. So praise the Lord for that. It's been a really exciting nine months. Look forward to recapping a little bit of that, um, of what the Lord's been doing in our lives and our ministry from the last time we had the privilege of joining you guys here on Sunday. So I'll make sure to get to that after the message and then we'll also be available for as long as we need afterwards here. Uh, to catch up with you guys and to touch base. So, many of you may recall, last time I was here in June, uh, the end of June last year, I spoke on the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. We talk about our understanding of Jesus as our great high priest, as one who is compassionate, one who has experienced our suffering, and one who now pleads on our behalf before the Father. The idea that God in person of Christ is not incapable of feeling our sufferings. He's not absent. He's not indifferent to the trials we go through. And today, we're going to follow a similar pattern to that, even though it's from a book written 2,000 years prior to Hebrews in a land far away outside of Israel. The book of Job examines the notion of what's called the righteous sufferer. Job, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the context, Job, we're told, was a righteous man. He feared God and he shunned evil. He was also a very wealthy man, the wealthiest, most powerful in all the land. He had thousands of heads of cattle, sheep, donkeys, many great possessions, his, uh, he, these beautiful, wonderful daughters and sons, wife. He had it all. He had the perfect situation, and he was the man for his time. But yet, through it all, he remained humble, and he praised God, and he shunned away from evil to the point where he would constantly offer sacrifice to God, not only for his behalf, but on behalf of his children as well, in case they sinned. In the midst of all the blessings, he never loses sight of the fact that everything he has even his very life comes from God. So uh, the context, just to set for our text today, is at the beginning, Satan comes before God and basically accuses God saying, well, of course Job praises you. Of course he loves you and worships you. Look at all you've given him. Look at all he's been blessed with. He doesn't really love you. He loves the stuff that you give him. He loves the stuff that comes from you. But if you take that away, he'll curse you. In a sense, he's only in it for what he can get out of it. He doesn't really love you for your sake. He just loves you for the stuff that comes from you. So God, in his power, now keep in mind here as we, as we examine the text, Satan only has as much power as God gives him. But God permits him, and this time says, okay, I give you permission to touch Job's life. So the first trial that Job goes through is the loss of his family, the loss of his sons and daughters who are massacred by raiders, and the loss of all his possessions, his livestock, which is consumed with fire from heaven. I mean, be hundreds of millions of dollars worth of possessions just gone in an instant, and all your children dead in a moment. And it's with that context we come to our uh, text today. So we pick it up in, verse one, in chapter 1, verse 20. Job's just heard this news. He's heard the reports from his only living servant who has told him what's just happened. Now picture how you might take this news. That all your children, all your loved ones have died. And you'll never see them again. And all your possessions have been consumed and burnt up in a fire. How does Job respond? Well, he stands up, tears his robe, and he shaves his head. And the tearing of the robe and the shaving of the head are symbols of humility and brokenness. To shave somebody's head in the ancient Near East was a sign of disrespect. It was almost dehumanizing. It was a practice that was done to slaves, to prisoners of war, essentially saying you have you've lost your humanness. You've lost all dignity before us and before God. So Job willingly does this to himself as a sign of humility before God, realizing how lowly he is. In the, midst of, in the midst of the presence of God. And he tears his robe as a sign of anguish, as a sign of brokenness. And he cries out to God, and 
What's really amazing about this, as um, commentator Roy B. Zuck states in his commentary on Job, he says, quote, Job followed adversity with adoration, woe with worship. And even in the midst of this incredible tragedy, this incredible agony that none of us could really conceive of in our lifetime, Lord willing, Job does cry out, but he follows it with immediate adoration and immediate worship of God. If it was me, I would like to shake my fist and cry and beat myself for maybe a few days, and then maybe I'd get around to praising God. <laughs> but Job, this incredibly humble man, immediately realizes that even in the midst of this trial, God is in control, and God is sovereign, and God is still blessing him. There was a man in 11th century France who was named Bernard of Clairvaux. He was an abbot, a theologian, and a medieval mysticist. A brilliant man. One of his greatest contributions to theology, to Christian literature, was when he talked about what he called the four stages of spiritual maturity. He talks about there are essentially four stages that we go through as humans in our relationship with God and in our love for God. The first stage is, he says, we love only ourselves. Everything we do is focused on our well-being, on our comfort, on our happiness, and it's about how can we better ourselves. Sort of this hedonistic mindset. We're sort of oblivious to God and his goodness and his blessings. The second stage up is where we do love God, but we love God for our own sake. We, we love God because we get good stuff from him. Where we say, if I praise God, if I worship him, if I obey him, then I'll be blessed with either material possessions or with life. In the sense of, well, I better praise God because I don't want to burn forever. You know, hell sounds like a bad place. It's all sort of that preschool kindergarten moment we all have where it's not so much a love of God, but it's a fear of going to hell. We say, all right, I'll follow Christ. I'll believe in God. I just don't want to go to that bad place. So we're still interested in our own well-being. Stage three, Bernard says, is where we love God for God's sake, but for our own sake as well. We start to, to realize God's worthy to be praised for who he is, because he is good, because he is holy, because he is powerful. But at the same time, we're still interested in ourselves. You know, we say, I, I, I need to look out for number one, too, but God is worthy simply because he's God. And then the fourth stage, which Bernard talks about, is where you love God simply for God's sake. Simply because he is God, simply because he is good, because he's worthy of it, regardless of what might happen. You say, I might lose everything, I might suffer immensely, I don't know what's going to happen, but I need to praise God because of who he is, because he's God, because he is righteous, and because he's my creator, and because everything I have, even my very life, is owed to him. And Bernard said that man never reaches stage four fully in this life. He says this is something that we see in the eternal state, we see in the resurrection. We see the scene painted out in Revelation of falling on our knees before God and worshiping him and humbling ourselves. But in this life, we're still somewhat focused on self until we break free from the sinfulness of our flesh. But if there was ever a man who, who I would say maybe had reached stage four, it'd be Job having gone through all this and having still praised God and realized all good things come from him. So, with that said, let's go back to the text here. So, chapter 1, or verse 20, Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he falls to the ground. The Hebrew reads, he literally fell down like face planted in the earth, and he prostrated, he bowed down and worshipped God. And he says, naked I came forth from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord is given, the Lord is taken back. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, when Job references my mother's womb here, this sort of has a twofold meaning. It can be understood literally as the womb of your mother coming forth, being born, because obviously when you're born, you're naked. I've never heard of a circumstance where that wasn't the case. If, if you ever have, I'd be interested in knowing. I don't think our son is going to come out wearing a onesie when he's born. <laughs> if he is, we'll send pictures. So you come forth naked to the world. Not just naked in the sense that you don't have any clothes. Naked in the sense of helpless. You come with nothing. You are in need of assistance for every facet of life when you're a newborn. You're dependent upon the grace and the compassion of others to simply survive. A child dropped in the world on their own will not survive. We all realize that. So Job's alluding to that, but he also seems to be alluding to this notion of coming from the dust of the earth. The womb in ancient Near Eastern literature, the mother's womb is often used synonymously with this idea of coming from the dust of the earth and returning to dust. Remember in Genesis, uh, in the creation account in Genesis, man was formed by God from the very dust of the earth. 
and God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And we're also told that to dust we will one day return. This idea of returning to the earth, returning to dust, is, is very prevalent throughout the rest of the book of Job. He talks about you know, resting in the grave, resting in the earth with, with the mighty men who've come before me, that even the greatest men, the mightiest kings and princes, they're now resting in the earth. And at the very end of the book, he says to God, I repent, I repent in dust and in ashes. For those of you who maybe have never uh, been to an Ash Wednesday service at either a, a Catholic or a Lutheran or an Anglican uh, church in a higher church model, uh, one of the practices is to go up and to receive a cross of ashes on your forehead. The idea is a symbolic reminder where the, they will then remind you that you have come from dust and to dust you shall return. This idea of humbling ourselves and giving ourselves perspective. The Lord has brought us from the earth and the Lord will take us back. So, with that in mind, Job has perspective, where he's come from and where he is going. So, and keep in mind also another important point, Job's belief and understanding of a resurrection was not how we see it today. The, his concept of, of what will happen to him after he died is, is different than, than the concept that we have, given both the, the words of Jesus in the New Testament, the assurance of the resurrection, and just the mindset that he was in. Job, keep in mind, was not an Israelite. He was not a child of Abraham. He was not a child of the covenant. He didn't have the, the special revelation that Moses and Abraham and the children of Israel had. So his understanding of God was somewhat different. Because at the end, he actually says, before I knew you only by hearsay, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. So he didn't have the certainty of what was going to happen to him. He knew, he didn't believe that death was the end, but he didn't know necessarily what's going to happen. So, but yet through that all, he still praises God, even in his uncertainty, even in his uncertainty of what will happen next. The great medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas writes regarding this passage, quote, when he says the Lord gave, he confessed that earthly prosperity does not come to men either accidentally according to fate or to the stars, or as a result of human exertion alone, but solely by divine direction. When he says, however, the Lord has taken away he also confesses that earthly adversities arise among men by the judgment of divine providence. This leads to the conclusion that man does not have a just complaint with God if he should be despoiled of his temporal goods, because he who gave so freely could bestow them either until the end of his life or temporarily. So when he takes temporal goods away from the man before the end of life, man cannot complain. All that we have, everything in this world, is by the grace of God. So as Aquinas writes here and as Job has perspective on that I so often lack is how can I complain if something's taken away? The Lord is given generously, the Lord is taken away, but over all the Lord is sovereign. Nothing happens outside of God's will. That's something we're going to touch on here a little more as we go. So moving along, we're told in 122 that Job committed no sin and he did not reproach the name of God. What does this tell us? We're told Job did not sin, but yet he tore his robe and shaved his head in mourning and anguish and he cried out. What does this mean? This means that to be faithful to God doesn't mean that we don't mourn. It doesn't mean that we're not sad for what we lose. It doesn't mean that when tragedy strikes, we just sit back and say, yay God, awesome. Family's dead. Everything I owned is gone. Awesome. You're great. I can't be sad because I'll be sin sinning against you if I'm upset because I'll be saying, you know, I don't trust you. No. Ecclesiastes 2, the famous verse where it says there's a time for everything, a uh, time for this and time for that. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for weeping. There's a time to be sorrowful. There's a time for anguish, uh, for that which we've lost, for that which causes us hurt, where it seems like God's blessing is departing from us. Because it's a reminder that we were made for something more than this. It's a reminder that all things in this world are temporary and that we long for the day when goodness and blessing will never depart, when we will not be in need of any comfort or in need of, of any material possession or any intimacy because we'll have perfect intimacy with our Lord. But there's a time for mourning. There's a time for loss. But mourning with the proper perspective that even in the midst of our trials, God is still in control. And God has meant this. And though we might not fully comprehend it, and Job does clearly not fully comprehend this, even in the end, the knowledge that God is in control is enough. 
Job was heartbroken and he felt the pain of loss, but he still praised God's name. So moving along, I want to kind of jump in the interest of time to chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. So we heard Bill explain how Satan comes back with his second trial where he says, where God says, Job has not reproached me. He still fears me and he has not given in. And Satan says, well, yeah, you know, he took his stuff, but he still has his health. You know, what's the old adage where somebody's down on their luck, you can say, well, hey, at least you got your health, you know, kind of that consolation prize. So Satan says, if I touch his skin, if I touch his flesh, then surely he'll curse you. Then surely he will turn against you. So again, God grants him this permission, but he says, do not take his life. Do not kill him, but touch his life. So Job is just afflicted with these horrible ulcers, these horrible boils from head to toe. So horrific where he takes a piece of, of pottery and tries to scrape the pus off his body. And I'm not saying this to try to gross you out, but just to get an image of how miserable this man must have been. I mean, if they were ever to make a movie out of the book of Job, it would be rated R just for that alone. It, where he's totally so disfigured that a couple of verses later when his friends come to visit him and console him, they don't even recognize him. He, he's almost unhuman at this point. Uh, just more physical suffering than I could ever comprehend. And in the midst of this all, his wonderful wife, and this is the only uh, word she speaks through all the book, and you can kind of see why. <laughs> she says, why persist in this integrity of yours? Curse God and die. To which Job aptly responds by calling her, literally in Hebrew, a foolish unbeliever. He says, if we are to take happiness from God's hand, must we not take sorrow too? And in all this misfortune, Job uttered no sinful word. Job acknowledges here that God's sovereignty is sovereign over both good and evil that come from him. And when we say this word evil, it's not necessarily how we would comprehend evil. It's not moral evil. But this word, ra'ah in Hebrew, is the word used often translated as evil in certain contexts in the Old Testament. Some people want to try to sanitize this and say, well, it's just misfortune or God's not the direct author. But Isaiah 45, 7 reads, quote, I form the light and I create the darkness. I, create, I make well-being and I create disaster. The word ra'ah. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is sovereign even over the trials and tribulations of our life. He's justified in them, and they work to serve his glory and to serve the good of those who love him, we're told in Romans. But yet God is sovereign over all this. And if we do take the blessings from God, do we not take his judgment and his trials as well? I've often heard people use this old adage that when things are going well, when they're experiencing blessing in their life, you know, their job's going great, their family's doing great, they say, the Lord is richly blessing me so much. God is so good. And conversely, when things are going rough and nothing seems to make sense and they feel attacked constantly, they say, Satan is just attacking me every day, left and right, that wicked Satan. You know, God just wants to bless me. God just wants to give me good things, but Satan's just a little too powerful. And, you know, God's going to win out in the end because he's stronger, but man, Satan gets a lot of punches in there and God doesn't want that. But, oh, just think, you know, just get to the end and then God will finally win out. So I ask you, what's, what's scarier? What's, what is harder to comprehend with the God you see in Scripture? The notion that God really wants to stop Satan, really wants to eliminate all sufferings or trials in our life, but that Satan's just a little too powerful and he can't quite do it? Or the notion that Satan and that our trials of this life only happen within God's will? That God is sovereign over all things, even the misfortune that might come our way, even though we cannot comprehend it, even though we might say, how does this make sense? How, how are you served by my suffering? How are you served by the loss of my loved ones, Lord God? But we know that you are in control because you have demonstrated your greatness to us. And you have demonstrated your love to us. Do we not take the good from God as well as the bad, Job says. To, to have this great perspective in the midst of this is something beyond me. It's something I just could not comprehend. But this righteous man has this perspective to realize the goodness of God. And to realize again that all he has in this life, his very life, comes from God. The great reformer Martin Luther once put it so poignantly, he said, To be sure, Satan does exist, but let us never forget that he is God's Satan. 
When we say that we want God sovereign over all things, when we say that we want God in control, do we truly mean all things? Do we truly mean even our trials? Even the tribulations we might go through? A great example of this I see in the events following the attacks on September 11th. 13 years ago now, I can't believe it's been that long, but thinking back in the, in the days, weeks, and months following, just the, the circumstances and the, the atmosphere surrounding the nation. During this time, there were several prominent Christian leaders and evangelists who came under immense fire and immense protest and outcry because they, in a manner of speaking, in a way of words, tended to suggest that the attacks on the World Trade Center, the attacks on the Pentagon, could be a judgment of God upon the nation. It could be God judging us or sending a message for abandoning him, for turning our backs on him, for giving in to moral corruption, and for refusing to acknowledge him as our Lord. So I'm not here to debate the merits of whether what they said was appropriate or not, especially given the timing, but they were subsequently criticized and you know, browbeaten in the media and just sort of ostracized as these horrible human beings in the midst of this. Yet, and I want you to try to realize the irony in this, what did you see everywhere you went in the days and weeks following September 11th? You saw bumper stickers, you saw billboards, flyers, signs in windows of shops with the American flag on them, and what phrase accompanied them so often? What? God we trust, or God bless America. God bless America. Oh, when God's blessing, we want him involved. We want him every moment involved. We want him sovereign because God is all about blessing. You know? But the notion that God could possibly judge, the notion that God could possibly send trials and tribulations which might cause us discomfort, no, no. Then we don't want God involved. Then God can't be sovereign in that. So do you see the irony? That, that, that we fall into that trap not just in a collective sense but as individuals as well. We want God's sovereignty when it suits us and when it makes us comfortable. But we don't want it when it might make us uncomfortable. Then we want to be our own sovereigns. The knowledge that God is sovereign over all things, even our own trials and tribulations, and this is, if you can take one major point away from today, try to make it this one. Because um, I know I've rambled on a lot and you might miss a few things, but I'm saying this to you. Try to take this one away. The knowledge that God is sovereign over all things means that there is no such thing as purposeless suffering. There is no such thing as purposeless evil in this world. Everything that happens, even the greatest trials and tribulations, have purpose. They have meaning. They don't happen because God is sitting up there and he's not quite powerful enough to stop them. They don't happen because God is this deistic God who just set things in motion and they just kind of play out and he sits back on the sidelines and watches. They don't happen because Satan is too powerful and God, again, just kind of is, is not able to stop him all the time. They happen because they serve the purpose and will of God. Now, we don't know what that means often. We're not made privy to it. Isaiah 55, 8 tells us that, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are as high above the earth as my ways are above your ways, and my thoughts are above your thoughts. Who are we to know the mind of God? None. But has he demonstrated that he means good for us? Has he demonstrated to us that he is sovereign and he is great? And that nothing happens outside of his will? Yes, he has. Job doesn't necessarily plead for his trials to end. He doesn't necessarily plead for an explanation. He longs for, for the day when they will. But what he truly desires in this moment is to see God face to face. Job desires an audience with God. And he cries out and even demands that his words be chiseled into stone so even after he is gone, even after, even if he doesn't see God in his flesh, that his record, his account and his story will be told and that someone, he believes, will plead his case before God. God finally does reveal himself to Job 36 chapters after this in chapter 38. And what happens here? God explains to Job exactly why everything happened, right? He tells him, yes, I know it sucks, but I did it because of this, this, and this. So you could be an example of suffering, an example of patience and endurance to all those who come after you. Thank you so much for participating in my little divine exercise. Here's, here's a reward. No. 
Now, Job's never given an explanation. We, the reader, see, obviously, what's going on behind the scenes, but Job doesn't know this. We're privy to more information than he has. But does Job leave unsatisfied in the end when God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, do you know when the sun rises and when it sets and so on and so on, all these majestic things that God does day by day, moment by moment, to display his providence? Job never received any sort of propositional explanation, but the truth is Job was still satisfied. Because when Job encounters God and he experiences the glory and the grandeur of the immortal, timeless, almighty God, when he stands in his presence, when he admittedly says, I have not only known you before by hearsay, and now I see you present right in front of me, that's enough for him. The experience of knowing God and seeing that he is sovereign and seeing that he is in control was enough for him. He didn't need an explanation at that point. He, said, he could say, God, I, I don't get it, but I get you. I see you. And I see that you are mighty and your ways, as Isaiah says, are not my ways. And then at the end, Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. And he realizes that all things work to serve the glory of God. His glory surpasses any sort of answer that Job could have received. I liken the analogy to a, a child with their parent, a young child. They don't necessarily need their parents to explain why something's happening when they're in time of distress. They just need the reassurance that their parent is there, that they're with them, and that they are in control, and that nothing's going to happen that they don't allow to happen. So how does this affect us? I want to try to bring this home and, and close with this picture. Job praises God for who he is, for what he's done, regardless of his own well-being, regardless of his own comfort. Could we do the same? Could we be a people and a church that praises God for who he is? A God who does bless us, who has promised us the gift of eternal life, who's promised us his, a presence with him in eternity, to be sure. But will we be a church that praises him even when trials of this life come? Even in the midst of great and measurable suffering? To say, Lord God, we don't know exactly why you brought this about, but we know that you are sovereign. We know that you make all things for your glory. Picture this. And for any of you who may have actually had to go through this, I can only imagine the pain that it would have caused. Picture that you're sitting in a hospital room and your child is laying in bed dying of an incurable disease, something the doctors don't know how to treat, and you're just crying out to God for answers, saying, why? Why? What now? Why did this have to happen? How does this make sense? How does this serve your purpose? How does this serve your kingdom that my innocent child is dying? And then picture that God all of a sudden comes into your room and sits down next to you, and you're looking at him face to face, and he says, I'm here. I've been here all along. I plan this. I will this to happen, but I'm in control. And what if you were to say that your child isn't going to get better? They're going to get worse and they're going to die. And that you're going to experience great discomfort even down the line, not just in this moment, but going forward. But fear not, for I'm in control. Do you trust me? Will we say yes? Would just being able to sit and see the glory of God, see his transcendence, see his almighty power, would that be enough for us? Or we demand and say, well, can you just show me how this works? Can you just show me how this fits into your grand scheme? Can we be a church that praises God for who he is, for his very nature? Amen. Thank you so much for, for this blessed opportunity, for this, this wonderful time to just share the words of the Lord with you. I, I just pray that he'd be glorified in this time. Just a brief update. I, I've used up a good majority of my time already sharing the word of the Lord, but that's fine. I'm always a pleasure to do that. 
brief update on the ministry front. The last nine months have been kind of a whirlwind for Jessica and myself. Uh, a good whirlwind, but a whirlwind nonetheless. Obviously finding out that we're being parents has kind of ratcheted up our, our timeline for everything here, but we're very excited for that. Um, I will be available, as I said, in the back afterwards to answer any questions you guys would have. I'd love to connect one-on-one -on -one and just share a little bit more about what we're doing, about the work the Campus Ambassadors is doing in Salem and throughout the Northwest and throughout the country for that matter. We have our email sign up back there if you guys are interested. And we do our monthly e-newsletter, uh, which goes directly to your inbox. It's got information on the latest happenings, different student stories we'll do each month. Um, it's got links to our websites, links to our Facebook pages. So it's a great way to keep updated with the latest that's going on. I just want to share a couple amazing stories from campus this last year. One of the biggest successes that we've had at Willamette is our work with the athletic teams, uh, the football and basketball teams specifically. We've noticed that there's a, a much higher concentration of Christians on sports teams than in the general student population. And we don't necessarily know why that is, but it is, so we're grateful for it. And every week our football Bible study draws about 15 to 25 students. Very committed, very dedicated, very willing to participate and, and make their faith make their love for God a priority in their life, even in the midst of an 80-hour work week that many of them uh, are faced with. <clears throat> so there's this natural built-in sense of camaraderie. And that's part of the approach of what we try to employ at Ambassadors. We try to take areas of built-in community, either sports teams or fraternities, sororities, student clubs, organizations, and we teach students, say, these are people you interact with every day. These are people you do life with every day. These are people who trust you, who have your back, who believe that you mean good for them. You know, you don't have to go seeking out random strangers on the street saying, hey, have you heard of Jesus? Have you heard of the gospel? Can I share it with you? There are people every day in your life that they trust and that are willing to, to believe you. They're willing to say, I want to know more about what this person has to say. So the, the work we've had with the sports teams has been just incredible. Another huge success is one of the central tenets of ambassadors, I always tell people, is our commitment to seeing students connected, active, and serving in the local church. We always say the last thing that we want to do is become a substitute for the church. We don't want to take its place. We want to work as an extension of it and see students active and serving in the body of Christ. In fact, we've had several occasions last semester where students have not been able to make events that we're doing on campus because they're serving in church. They're you know, watching uh, students during Wednesday night service. They're helping to greet. They're helping to lead a Bible study. And we say, amen, awesome. That's what we want to see, that we would decrease so that the church, the body of Christ, might increase, excuse me. And we've had dozens of new students that have found church homes here this last year. Not just going on Sundays, hearing the message and kind of sneaking on out, but being involved, participating, taking ownership, saying for my time here in school, for my four years here at Willamette, I'm committed to serving this body of Christ. To, to being active, to being poured into as well by older generations, being given perspective by their elders on what it means to be a godly man or a godly woman, a godly husband, a godly father. So it's just been really, really awesome to see students making that connection, making that desire. And I say, hey, if it's within my power, I will come and pick every one of you up and drop you off all over town. And it's a big town, so, but I will do it if that's what it takes. So we've been, over, we've been blessed with that. A um, couple of other things really quick. We've had uh, the last two months, we actually were blessed to be able to, in our discipleship group on Wednesday nights, we were blessed to be able to talk about apologetics with students. We asked them at the beginning of the semester, what do you guys want to discuss going forward? What do you want to talk about in the discipleship group? And they say, we want to learn how to defend our faith. We want to learn how to answer the questions we hear every day and answer the challenges that our professors pose to us and sometimes openly mock us in class. We've got students that have come in tears because they've come from a class where their professor has mocked them openly for their faith and said, in a nutshell, how can you be so stupid? Clearly, if you were thinking, you would realize that faith is a myth, that the Bible can't be trusted, that naturalism is the only real explanation. So what we've desired to do is to show students that the faith you have in God, the faith you have in Christ, the faith you have in the scriptures, it's not some blind shot in the dark. It's not something where we just throw a bunch of darts and hope one hits right and say, I don't know, but I better have my bases covered. No, it's based in reason. It's based in evidence. Not proof, but evidence. So we have good reason to believe the word of God. We have good reason to believe God's promises. Yes, we live by faith, 
but faith is based on what God has done and who he is and how he has revealed himself. So that's been a real joyous time. I've been able to get my geeky brain on during it, which I really love. So anyways, I don't want to take up too much time here, but I just want to share a couple of amazing stories. Like I said, Jessica and I will be available in the back afterwards. We'll stay as long as we need to. We'd love to connect with each and every one of you, share a little bit more about what the Lord is doing uh, and how you guys can help to be a part of that. And just a really brief note uh, before I go. Um, on the support front, when we came here last June, we had just kind of started the process. We were at about 15%, so just kind of getting started, just thinking, how are we ever going to climb this massive mountain? Well, today, I'm pleased to share that we're over 60% uh, to being fully funded and committed support. Our goal is to be fully funded on campus full time by the beginning of fall semester here, which starts at the end of August. So, still a long ways to go, but God has been good. He's opened up doors left and right, and we're so excited for that. And an especially awesome opportunity that we have coming up here, um, I shared this with, with Daryl and Dan, but I'll share it with you guys as well, and if you're interested, I can get you more information. In just a little over a month, on May 3rd, uh, we are hosting the annual CA fundraiser dinner at Willamette. What's amazing about this is not just the opportunity for people from the community to, to join us and support and to hear wonderful student stories about how the Lord's impacted their life through CA, but we also have several very generous donors who have pledged to match every single dollar that we raise during this time. So what's amazing about that is for the next month, if, uh, if anybody is interested in making a donation toward that, your donation will be doubled. So it's a great opportunity. Uh, these are some incredibly generous people who believe in the work we're doing and say no matter what, whatever you guys are able to raise. And we keep raising the amount every year and they keep meeting it. So we're gonna try to, this goal this year is we wanna do 30,000. And they say if you can do it, we will match it. So if you've been thinking about the possibility of, of supporting the work we do financially, this is the best time to possibly do it. And like I said, I'll have more details for you in the back if you're interested. Thank you all so much. Thank you for this blessed opportunity.